the Ernie Chambers Show. Brothers and sisters, friends, enemies, and neutrals, I'm back again, and there are things happening in the world that are very stressful, upsetting, they are inhumane, should not happen, but that teaches the nature of the world and the reality of existence. The word should lets you know that that is aspirational. You hope, wish, luck, and pray. But then when that's the approach you have to take, you have to think of that song, I think Dusty Springfield sang, wishing and hoping and singing and praying. None of that is going to change anything. If I have a tree and it is an obstacle or a hazard and it has to be removed, I can pray until if my black were, my hair were black, until it turns gray. If I stand as straight as a tree, I could pray until my, I'm so old that my muscles won't even support the weight of my head and my back is bent and that tree not as, only is gonna remain there, it's gonna be bigger and stronger. Action is what brings about results. There's a principle of physics, I don't know much about physics, so I'm not gonna give you a lesson, but for every action, there's an opposite and equal reaction. When I was in the army, I was in the infantry, we had what people called a bazooka. It was called a rocket launcher, and it consisted of a tube, and you'd put the projectile in it, and the man who was your mate, when he had everything loaded, he'd tap you on the helmet and you would have it loaded and you aim and you pull the trigger and the projectile goes out. Well, to demonstrate the danger of standing behind that weapon, the army did as they did everything. They followed a principle that Hitler laid out. If you are trying to propagandize or instruct the masses of people, you must gear your efforts to those of the lowest in mentality. That's the level on which you need to operate. So it was not enough to explain to all of us who were, they had a term for you when you just get in the army. But anyway, we were all privates. They would tell you, how much power is in this explosion when the shell hits, how much force is generated and so forth, and how much force comes out of the back end as the projectile goes out the front end. So what they did was had a demonstration. They had a sergeant who was going to fire the weapon, and they had the instructor who was also a sergeant who was explaining what was going to happen and as he was talking, he suddenly tapped the man on the helmet and kazoom, there it went. But what nobody had thought about was this huge stack of boxes and crates behind the one with the bazooka. Well, when that projectile went out the front and all that back blast came out the back, it just destroyed all of that pile of boxes as though the projectile had come out the back. And they used object lessons to make a point. Sometimes you can be the most articulate, fluent person when it comes to expressing ideas and words. But on occasion, you're dealing with people where words are not enough, a demonstration or an example is called for. War should not be on television. It should not be televised. Not to prevent the public from seeing the horrors of war. But when you put lights, camera, 
and action into the equation, then it causes men to tend to become actors. A role has to be played, R-O-L-E. And that's what's happening to the president in Ukraine. Before he won that office, he was a comedian. He addressed audiences. He wanted to make people laugh. He was accustomed to the spotlight. When Russia first began to menace Ukraine and they show on television these long lines of Russian tanks, everybody, including me, thought that this is not going to be a long engagement. There's no way Ukraine can meet and resist this kind of force, let alone bring it to a standstill or repel it. Then when the various assaults occurred, buildings destroyed, homes, schools, it didn't matter. It didn't matter what went on in the building where the children were being caught, taught, where the babies were being born. Russia was going to show what brute force can do. And Russia had the capacity to inflict by use of brute force more destruction than Ukraine could absorb and continue to exist as a nation. There were others in Europe. There were others in military establishments all over the world who understand strategy and tactics. Tactical is a word that relates to small operations. We're going to take this objective. We're going to take that objective. We're going to move this many yards, meters, kilometers, or however we destroy it. Strategy or strategic thinking takes in the entire area. You can say it's a worldview, not speaking of the planet, but everything connected with that battle that is taking place. Some people are good tacticians. They know how to capture and hold for a short time this objective, but when it comes to the strategic thinking where you have to determine 10 or 12 things that have to occur, desynchronized and coordinated, have to be executed sequentially, two follows one, three follows two, and so forth. There are battlefield generals, battlefield captains who cannot think at that level because they've never been trained to do it. Now, there are some people who are very good when it comes to thinking strategically, who had gotten battlefield experience and knowledge, so they would have the practical understanding of what occurs where men are killing men. Not where you got numbers on paper, we lost 30,000, they lost 28,000. That means we now have so many and they have so many. No, they had that experience where you might look a man in his face. You might be close enough to smell his breath. It might even be hand-to-hand -hand combat and then you take his life or he takes yours. War is not a game. War is not play acting. Zelensky was a comedian, he was used to the spotlight and being the lead story on television all over the world every day brought out that stage persona. And now he does things that an actor would do. There are certain venues in which he will wear a suit just like all the other suit wearers. I had one outfit if you want to call it that. I wore a sweatshirt and jeans, and that's all that I wore. Not the same shirt every day, not the same jeans, 
but I didn't have a wardrobe as that term is understood. Zelensky started by wearing his, you might call it a t-shirt, but it was more the consistency of a sweatshirt. And that was his persona. Whenever you saw him, that's what he was wearing, no matter what anybody else was wearing. In fact, they started making those kind of shirts or replicas of them around the world and people wore them. Then he would wear suits. He got out of the comedian role. He got out of the man of the streets, man of the people role. And now he's gonna rub elbows with diplomats and heads of large countries. So he went into his act. He says things for effect. There is no way that Ukraine is going to stand up to Russia. Some people feel I shouldn't even say this, even though I'm not in the legislature, meaning I have no official position. I have no platform as I once had. I certainly don't have the megaphone to magnify what I say, as was the case when I was a member of a governing body that made laws. But wherever I was, I always was me. Whatever I said was based on what I believed. So it didn't matter where I was, who was in the audience or anything else. They would always say, Ernie is Ernie and Ernie's going to be Ernie because what I believe is what I'm going to say. What I think is what I'm going to let come out. That doesn't mean I'll tell everything I know as soon as I learn it. But when I make a statement, it's what I believe and what I think. When I act, it's in accord with what I believe. That's why I never carried a pistol, never carried a knife, never hid from anybody, never ran from anybody, never took cover when people were fearful. There were people who didn't think I should go certain places in this state alone, especially at night, but because of what I believed, that's what I did. There was a mixed family in York, Nebraska, which is a good distance from this side of the state. And some white people marched on their home, carrying crosses and some wearing Ku Klux Klan hoods. And when I read it in the paper, I was furious. Here are two people and a town is going to swoop down on them in this fashion in a state like Nebraska, which is supposed to have something going for itself in terms of integrity, family values, morality, Christianity, and all the rest in the heart of America with liberty and justice for all. All men and women are created equal and that's happening and nobody stood up for those people. So you know what old crazy me did? Got in my car and drove to York and appeared at a meeting they had in the nighttime to condemn them as cowards and racists for what they did to this family who had harmed nobody. Nothing they did was hurting anyone. And here come the bullies, here comes the cowards, here come the mob. And then I would tell them, but when it comes to me, here comes Ernie alone. No bodyguards, no guns, just me and ye. Do I think I could handle everybody in this room if you all came up here at one time? That would be preposterous. Then why will I come and put myself in jeopardy like that? Because the way I know white people or feel that I know white people, I don't feel that I'm in jeopardy. If you have to look me in the eye, you're not going to come up on me. So here I sit and it was something like where I am now. I was at a table in the front of the room and all of these people were between me and the door. 
And I said to all of them on their terrain, what I would have said on the floor of the legislature or anywhere else, because wherever I am, I am me. If I'm going to speak, I'm going to speak what I believe. The attorney general, this was not many years ago, two or three years ago, became concerned about attacks and threats being made against and upon elected officials. There were some demonstrators who would go into state houses and he thought that the senators and others who worked in the Capitol building might be at risk. So he wanted to restrict entry to the Capitol building to one entrance and there would be metal detectors and of course state troopers in case they would be needed. And guess who spoke against it and prevented it from happening? And guess what the story was that was written? Senator Chambers, who has gotten more threats against his life than anybody in government, who has had the threats stuck to his door, slid under his door, yet he is the one who said this building belongs to the people, it should be open to the public, and they should not have to go through metal, metal detectors to enter this building. So that is not going to happen while I'm here, and it didn't happen. And on occasions like that, the white media would call attention to the fact that I get the threats and so forth. But threats to me are just words. That's to me, but not everybody is me. And I wouldn't advise anybody to do as I do. If there were another man like me or a woman like me, I would not advise that person to do what I have done. And if there was some way I could restrain them, I would. Because they have a value beyond just what they have in terms of themselves and their family. They have a value to the community. But there was something perverse in me, not perverted, something in me that compelled me to do what I would do everything within my power to prevent somebody else from doing. And I'm saying all that for a reason. If I say something, I say what I mean. If I believe something, that is going to determine how I behave. Wisdom has nothing to do with it. I, like anybody else, have that will and that desire to survive. But sometimes some circumstances can overcome that drive to survive, that desire to survive, but not the will to survive. And even in a hostile setting where I am so tremendously outnumbered, there's no chance I would have to prevail in a physical way. I would nevertheless do everything I possibly could to survive. This may sound contradictory, but I'm trying to be as straightforward as I can because there are people who are aware of the, they call it chances, the chances that I've taken, the places that I've gone, the threats, the hazards that I have subjected myself to and not for the sake of being on a camera but to be able to get along with somebody who knows me better than anybody else somebody who will lash me to ribbons metaphorically speaking and that somebody is deep down inside of me somebody I cannot fool somebody I cannot deceive, somebody who will never betray me. And that's what causes me to function as I do. But my standards cannot be something I would try to impose on anybody else. In the same way that I'm gonna follow my mind, let them follow theirs. Maybe I would say, never in a thousand years would I do what they're doing. But if that's what they believe, if that's what their mind tells them to do, 
I'm not the one who has a heaven to reward them with or a hell to punish them in. And if I'm going to give them some pie, it's not going to be in the sky, in the sweet by and by. It'll be on a plate right here with a fork or they can eat it with their hands right now if pie is what I'm going to give them. When I hear the comment made that police every day will leave home and put their life on the line. I knew that wasn't true because I dealt with so many cowardly cops when I was growing up. I saw the way they abused black people, the way they were always bold when they had the ups on somebody. They had the gun, they had the jail, they had the judges, everything on their side. But if you got one of them alone, it became a different story. And they thought in the early days that I was a coward, I guess, because they would try to bully me and they never could. They couldn't make me back down. That doesn't mean if somebody put a gun on my nose and said, if you say another word, I'll blow your brains out, that I'd keep yakety yakking. Nope, silent night, because I have intelligence. But when it comes to me being what I have to be to have self-respect, then I have to do what I have to do. So we as a people should try to come together and work with each other and not against each other. Not who's going to be the grandest tiger in the jungle, who's going to get the credit for it. People want those things, but when we're working for the benefit of the community, those should not be our guiding principles. Nobody should be able to give you something around the corner when nobody else black is looking. Then you come from around that corner saying something just a little different from what you said before you went back there and your palm was greased. We in the community are not stupid. We may not know A from bullfrog. We may cannot read the alphabet and boxcar letters on the side of a Union Pacific train, but we understand people and we know when there's somebody who has sold us out. We know who the ones who are selling us out. We know the ones who are taking money from white people to say what white people want us to say. We know those people who will speak and go only so far then hush up and get scared when that line is there that they're approaching, which they've been told by the white people, you better not cross. Until we have those kind of people speaking for us, we as a race are not going to get where we need to be. There were two women who were testifying at this January 6th congressional committee hearing, as they call it, about what happened January 6, 2021, when white people stormed their capital, broke, built, broke out windows, had all senators and Congress people running for their lives, fashion a noose, and we're hollering, hang Mike Pence, the vice president, and this group called the Proud Boys, which is another word for Ku Klux Klan, Nazi, and all the other cowardly groups that they are. And they always do it in a gang, always do it in a group, always when they're armed against people who are not armed, never one-on-one. -on -one. They always want to be carrying they're semi-automatic weapons, wearing protective gear, putting on the front and walking the dog, but they're afraid of their shadow. That's why they dress like that. You know the most protective garment I wear? A sweatshirt. And I went into hostile territory to give talks. And in the state of Nebraska, where at that time they had the Nazi party, the Ku Klux Klan, all these racist organizations and they were in the rural areas and that's where I went and I have articles to prove everything that I'm saying. A challenge was put out and I accepted the challenge. I was threatened in a city and that's where I went and announced that that's where I'm coming. A complaint was made against me by a chief of police who was fired from a little town because I went, I got on his case. He had assaulted the daughter 
of a mayor in another small town, but he was afraid to say anything about it, but it was told to me and I publicized it. And that's the town I went to. And I went out there to York when these white people had terrorized this interracial couple because I couldn't stand to watch those who are weak and helpless set upon without doing what little, and it might be very little, that I could do to at least show that this is not what I approve of. And I may not be able to whip all of you, but I'm not gonna run from you, I'll run to you. And that doesn't mean if there were six people with guns there, and if I move, they're gonna shoot me that uh, John Wayne and television and movies, I'm gonna say, well, shoot me. And they say, well, you asked for it. And they say, yes, yeah, I'm not crazy. But what's that song that Billy Joel sang? You may be right. You say I'm crazy. Oh, but it just might be a lunatic you're looking for. Turn out the light. Don't try to save me. You may be wrong, but for all I know, you may be right. And told this woman she might like a little insanity for a little while. I like the song, but I'm coming back to the reality. These two black women were poll workers in Georgia. And they were at a table. They were helping to count ballots and doing the things that people do. Rudy Giuliani, this coward. Donald Trump, this coward. The leaders of the white cowards in the society, and that's what they are. When they've got the ups, they yell and they holler and they stomp and snore and spit, but they always have to do it in a gang. And when they've got everybody outnumbered, they're armed and the other person isn't. Giuliani had some, I guess there may have been some video, had still shots made, ran them as ads in the newspapers, and where this black woman's mother was giving her a mint. He said they were passing drugs to each other. Called the mother by name 18 times, Donald Trump did, condemning her as a scammer, one who corrupted elections and so forth. And she had never done any of that. And when she was testifying, she said the president is supposed to represent all the people, not attack somebody. But that's what the coward did, the bully. And he's as nutty as a fruitcake and all these cowardly white men running behind him screaming and hollering show what cowards they are. And that's what they are. They always have to do it in a mob. And if they're so bold and brave, why do they have to take a mob to get one black man? But nevertheless, these black women testified and it was on television, this particular hearing. You could see the faces of the people in the audience and they were pained by what these women were saying. Here's the president of the United States, supposedly the most powerful man who runs the most powerful country in the world, lying on attacking two black women. This woman who was testifying and her mother had spoken at a different gathering, a different, in a different setting, but it was videotaped and some of it was played at this particular hearing. She was at a table and she was explaining the fear, how her life was turned upside down. And the daughter was explaining how hard it was for her to see these things happen to her mother and she was blaming herself because of what these cowardly white racist devils as the Muslim call them, in their cowardly way, we're doing by way of attacking her. And here's what I give the Muslims credit for all the time, the so-called black Muslims. They had what's called the fruit of Islam. It was their military arm, but they didn't go out bullying people. They didn't carry weapons. But that black woman, who was the mother of the woman who was working with her, would not have had to endure seeing the grandmother of the one testifying, whose mother was her grandmother, living at her home, 
having white people bursting into the home saying they're going to make a citizen's arrest. The Muslims would not have tolerated that in a black community. And these cowardly white people would not have come where the Muslims were located because there would have been something waiting for them. But they know that there's a different brand of black person now. A turn the other cheek black person. A we shall overcome black person. I think voting is essential. Politics is what makes this country run. We need to register, we need to vote, but we need to stand up for ourselves and not let anybody run over us. I don't have a solution that I give to people and say, this is what you ought to do individually. I speak in terms of what we as a people ought to do and give examples of what I have done, but which I would recommend against others doing because they're not me. Dan Goodwin, Leroy Carter, Bill Armstrong, Ronnie Magruder, and a few other black men would go with this group called the 4CL, the Citizens Coordinating Committee for Civil Liberties, who conducted demonstrations during the time when this was happening, during the 60s. And those ministers always would ask us, would we come along? Because they knew we wouldn't bother anybody, but nobody's gonna bother these people that we were with. We were not there to show that we can take somebody hitting us upside the head and we ask Jesus to save them. No, if we could, we'd send them home to Jesus. And we didn't carry weapons either. But when these white men, and cowards knew that there were some black men who'd stand up to them. None of these groups, when they demonstrated, ever were attacked when we were with them. Self-defense was what we believed in. And when white people listened to Martin Luther King saying, turn the other cheek, and they asked, isn't that the way to do it? I say, here's when I'll accept turning the other cheek and trying to get our rights by singing, we shall overcome. When you send your Marines to storm the enemy and run up on the shore, and they're gonna come fighting with prayer books and the Mormon Tabernacle Choir singing behind them, we shall overcome, then you might be able to persuade me that the way for me to get my rights is let somebody put knots and bumps upside my head, spit on me, mistreat my women, our women, turn the other cheek. You might be able to persuade me of that if I've gone crazy. But until I've gone crazy, you're not going to persuade me of anything like that. I'm not going to bother anybody. But I'm not going to let anybody bother me. This man from Ukraine has people around the world talking about helping Ukraine and all military men who know anything are aware that they can give Ukrainians all the howitzers that they want to give them. But Ukrainians don't know how to use them. So they brought some to America to teach them how to use these weapons that their president is saying they need hundreds of. They don't even have people who can use them. Don't ask for airplanes because they'll be shot down by Russian missiles. Don't fire a bullet on Russian soil because then you will have attacked the fatherland and then there may be a massive invasion and there might be air strikes from Russian planes. And that might draw some other European countries into it, which in turn might draw America into it, which in turn might make Russia unleash those supersonic weapons that they have that are capable of carrying a nuclear warhead. And North Korea, Russia's ally against America, have developed a hypersonic, meaning it goes faster than sound, missiles, and they've got one at least that will reach the United States. Oh, and there's a country with about 800 million or so people 
called China, which has thermonuclear weapons, which has a space station. And there are some generals in America talking to some politicians who got at least a nickel's worth of cents. That means they've got five senses and all of them are working. So you say you've got a nickel worth of cents, all five of them are operational and all of them are located in your head. Sight, smell, taste, feel, and hearing. All five of the senses, if you forget what they are, just think about what you got going on in your head. That's the where the brain is. Wherever the most mental activity is going on, they call it the brain center. But anyway, there would be China, North Korea, and Russia. Now, if they unleash nuclear weapons on the United States, maybe that's when the preachers would jump up and say, praise God Almighty, we told you there's going to be a bad war of Battle of Armageddon, and it's here now. The whole world is going to go up in smoke, and the Bible will have been fulfilled, and maybe somebody will put some weapons in the hands of the Palestinians who have been abused, who've been bullied, who've been oppressed by the Israelis. Their land was taken, homes taken, kicked out of their own homes. Jews took their homes. And as long as America is backing Israel, Israel has safety. They say, well, my big brother got me covered. Well, when big brother got his pants being pressed and nobody's covering Israel, then somebody is going to do something to Israel. There's Iraq. There's Iran. There is Lebanon. There are the Palestinians. See, Israel is tough as long as America is backing them. But you let this Ukraine guy bring about a set of circumstances where European countries are going to feel they should send men, soldiers, into Ukraine to stand against Russia then you know something very bad is about to happen. But the European countries are not crazy. They're not going to do that. At some point, the Republicans might put enough pressure on a Democrat where he'll say, well, to stay in power in America, I better send a few soldiers over there. You saw some of these fool Americans run over there into Ukraine, didn't you? Play acting, a television war, not a real war, make believe. Only make believe but it's real and they were real then two more of them got killed but some were captured and they're not going to be taken to russia as prisoners of war and although they were captured by russian forces they're saying they're the separatists in ukraine who captured them and now hold them but since they came from America and they were shooting at Russian soldiers, trying to kill Russian soldiers. They were committing crimes against Russia. And if they decide to, Russia will have them extradited from Ukraine into Russia where they will stand trial for having committed war crimes. And you think Russia won't do this? Ask the people who know about the basketball player, Sister Griner, who's been there over 100 days. And just the other day, a Russian court extended the period of her imprisonment. And there's nothing America can or will do about it. You have all these right wing people on Fox News and writing these articles and hooping and hollering when there are bunches of them attacking the capital of the United States, but there's nothing they're gonna do to Russia. All Russia does is sit back and say, America can't take care of their own seat of government. And there are government officials called Republicans, Republicans who want to justify 
what these crazy people did in taking over the place where the lawmakers work, ran the lawmakers out of their offices, pictures of them sitting in the chair with their ankles crossed and feet on the desk, going into the chamber where they make laws. That's what's happening in America. And America's gonna do something to Russia and they can't take care of their own affairs, bring it on. But Biden and other people who will make military decisions are saying there'll be no military forces, no ground forces wearing American uniforms going into Ukraine to try to fight Russia. Crazy. They should have learned something in Korea, but they didn't. And they were going to do some bad things to the Koreans. And then they got a little close to China and all of the Chinese came running and ran them all the way across the Yalu River, hollering Yalu and hallelujah, and wanted to reach an armistice because they were looking at Korea as a small country, but Korea abuts China. And what Korea was, was like the small tip end of the fingernail of a huge fire breathing dragon, China. And when China sent wave after wave of armed persons like Americans had never seen, they showed why they win the dashes and short races and the Olympics. These Americans can run when they have a little inspiration. They went into Vietnam. There was a battle that the French had in Vietnam, Dien Dien Phu. And the French had their trousers pressed and ran out. So here comes America gonna show what they can do. And by the time it was over, America ran out after losing thousands, not losing, squandering thousands of young men's lives. Donald Trump was not among any of them at any of these wars. Donald Trump was the son of a rich man. I said son of a rich, not son of that other word. I'm not a Christian, so I don't use that kind of language. Donald Trump had a sore in the heel bone so he didn't have to go into the war. They got messed over in Korea, run out of Vietnam, kicked out of Afghanistan. But see, America just joined a long line of big shots. French got kicked out, Russians got kicked out. It's called the graveyard of superpowers. America said, but this is the kid. This is John Wayne. We are here now. Well, there were people who had heard that before, spoken in different languages, and all of them got kicked out, and so did America. People hated the man that, in the middle of the night, when he was with his family, they ambushed and murdered. He was not armed. They wouldn't tell where his body was. Some said it may have been incinerated and dropped in the ocean. But he, in helping the people, did not, he was a scion of a rich family. They were contractors. He joined the fighters. They carved out huge caves in the mountainous areas. And when they went to those caves, nobody could dislodge them. And I haven't given you his name on purpose. And I may not give you his name. But when Obama got the word that these forces 
special forces had killed him, there was great joy in most of America. But he was a better man than all of them. He did not tell people, you go fight. I may as well tell you it was Osama bin Laden. He led the forces. He carried a weapon. And he was a whale of a fighter, a whale of a strategist, tactician. And they went through a lot of trouble, but they finally managed to kill him. That's what Americans are good at doing, killing somebody. And they practice on some of their presidents. This is the nation that kills presidents. And when some have been injured but not killed, it's not because somebody wasn't trying. And this is not the direction that I intended to go when I came in here today. But there are times that are very troubling. And I use words like to the spirit, not that I believe in spirits like other people, but these are terms that other people understand that are troubling to the spirit, things that need to be said. And for all I know, nobody is hearing a word that I'm saying, but I don't know that. So I have the opportunity to speak and that's what I'm doing. I was going to talk about the shootings, the one in Buffalo where the black people were slaughtered, the one in Texas where the Latino children were slaughtered. And now the truth is coming out there that within three minutes of that guy getting into that school, there were cops on the scene. There were cops in the building and they lied afterward, the head man, and said that they were waiting to get a key so that they could open the door where he was, but the door was lock not locked and it couldn't lock. It couldn't be locked from the inside. They said they needed more equipment, what they call a shield. Well, the camera showed that they had a shield and there were officers clogging the halls. But these cops who they hear you, you hear them talk about every day they get up, they lay their life on the line and there they are not laying their life on the line, staying out in the hallway in large numbers, getting each in each other's way while a butcher is in there slaughtering little children who are in the, in the process of calling 911 for help. And these cops are there. Yeah, they lay down their life. They tell you that mess and you buy it. Having raised, been raised in a black community, I know how rotten these cops are. I know how bullying they can be even when dealing with black children. I was not always a grown man. I live in North Omaha and have all my life and I watched them. I saw the things that they did. Nobody can tell me these cops are heroes. Am I saying every cop is rotten? Not all of everybody of any group is rotten, but the so-called and supposed good ones won't bring the rotten ones in check. So I'm entitled to say that they won't do the dirty work, but since they support and back those who do the dirty work, they're all in it together. If I commit a murder and you all plotted it with me, you are an accessory before the fact, if it happened before I did the killing and after the fact, if you try to help me cover it up, you share the blame for what I did. These cops know who the killer cops are and they won't do anything about it. And as long as they don't do anything about them, they're just like the rest of them who do it. And those cowards are now having the cover jerked off them. Next week, I probably will talk about what the committee said. I will talk about Ukraine to a greater extent. But I want to emphasize, Ukraine is not going to win. There is never a chance, never was a chance it's just a question of how many innocent Ukrainians Zelensky 
who has the Ukrainian version of the first name Vladimir Putin has, their names are the same, except that Vladimir in Ukraine pronounces this differently and spells it differently, but it's pronounced basically the same. We're going to fight. Well, he hasn't fired a shot. He hasn't been in the thick of a battle. I was listening to public radio yesterday about these guys who go around exhuming bodies of Russians and Ukrainians to give them a proper burial in a cemetery. They talk about the stench and all the danger of it, but it's work that somebody has to do. And one guy was saying that he recognizes neighbors when he exhumes some of these bodies and it makes him cry. And he will see a Russian soldier, somebody for whom he has contempt and hatred because this Russian may be the one who killed his neighbor. But then he said, he stops to think that somewhere there is a family mourning for this man that I'm going to bury properly in the way that I'm mourning my neighbor. I was reading that there are more and more desertions from the Russian forces and the Ukrainian forces. They're getting tired. They're weary. The politicians have taken over. Politicians in America, politicians in Europe, and naturally politicians in Russia. But who are the ones dying? The ones who have no say so. But there have been reports, I don't know how they verify them, of armed confrontations between units in Russia and the generals and other commanders who are trying to make them take a certain position and they refuse to do it. They realize that this is not a war in the traditional sense. This is a politician's war. And the men who carry the guns, do the fighting and dying, are expendable. There are plenty more of those where these came from. So you've got a chemical plant in Ukraine that you're not going to operate. You're not going to make any chemicals. If you did, you're not going to do anything with them. And there were men dying to hold that chemical plant. Hold it for what? Well, when the Russians come, they're going to need this building. And so we're just kind of maintaining it. That's not what it said, but that's what it amounts to. Why will you sacrifice lives to hold a chemical plant? And the Russians are not going to use it to make chemicals. They can make all the chemicals they want. Ukraine is through. And as I mentioned last week, they're the ones, not all Ukrainians, and not at all of the death camps, but at the most notorious death camp in all of the time that the Holocaust, as they call it, was going on, Treblinka, a few miles from Warsaw in Poland. It was for the sole purpose of killing people, exterminating human beings. How can you more efficiently and effectively kill many people and dispose of their remains? That's what Treblinka was about. And the guards were Ukrainians. And these stupid Americans who don't know history running over there as though they're going to liberate Ukraine from the Russians. They cannot even liberate the part of Ukraine which is full of Russian sympathizers and they control that part of Ukraine. These Americans don't know anything except what they see on Fox television hear from people like Rush Limbaugh, who fortunately for the world is no longer here, spewing his poison, his hatred, and his false information. People in America won't listen while there's time to listen. They won't listen to anybody they don't like. When I was giving talks around the country, literally, I would emphasize this point. You white people, and they didn't like to be called you white people. I say, isn't that what you are? And that was to make them understand why we don't want white people referring to black people as you people. They think it's all right. But then when I say you white people, they don't like it. They can give it, but they can't take it. They'll give something to you to eat off this plate. But when you turn the plate around and say you eat it, 
then they feel like you're being insulting to them. When we couldn't pay rent, they said it because you're, you're, they said it's because you're lazy. Now they can't pay rent and they're losing their homes, but nobody's calling them lazy. They're saying we got to find a way to get some assistance and aid to them, some rental assistance so they can keep their homes. Well, why they got the hand out begging? That's what they said about us. When we couldn't get jobs, we'd do the work of two or three people on two or three jobs, literally, and get pennies for it. And they said we were complainers. And we wouldn't work. And we worked harder than anybody in this country. And they knew it. And that's why they would hire us. They could get us to do the work of more than one person and pay us less than a third of what they pay one white person who's not going to work. You know what Ethel Waters said? She was the first one to get an Oscar. And she got an Oscar for playing the role that they want us to be in, which is a maid. Working for white people. Cleaning their rear end. Servicing the white man when he couldn't get what he wanted from the white woman, nursing their babies, being called a mammy. And you know what Ethel Waters said? I believe she was the one. I mix them up. We've had some Aunt Jemimas. She said, as far as the role in, in movies, she said, I would rather get paid $500 a week playing a maid than $5 a week being a maid. And that made cents and dollars. I would tell these white people, you are allowing your white agencies, the CIA, the FBI, local police, to sharpen their tools of oppression on us because we don't count. They practice on us, but they've got bigger fish to fry, a bigger goal in mind. They're going to turn those weapons of oppression, which have been perfected against us, hiding in plain sight from you. You watch them do it and you applauded them for doing it. And then they're going to turn them on you. And you'll run to the rocks to hide your face. The rocks will cry out, no hiding place, no hiding place down here. You all can hardly pay your bills. You can't buy food. You can't get gas for your cars. You can get some, but not like you used to, not like you need, and you're crying. Who are you crying to? The ones who are doing it to you. You think the big corporations are suffering? There is no shortage of gasoline. There is no shortage of gasoline, but it gives everybody the opportunity to gouge. And you know how they justify it? They say, well, when it comes to buying gasoline, it's like futures where you charge prices today. You make contracts to cover future transactions. And there might be plenty of oil today, but the contract for the future delivery of oil cannot be based on today's prices because there may be a shortage of oil. So we are going to make the contract in 2022 based on the shortages that may occur in the future, although right now in 2022 and maybe in 2023 and 24 and 25, there's plenty of oil to make plenty of gasoline but we may as well charge the prices under these contracts for what may happen in the future. Does that make sense? It makes sense in dollars to people like Warren Buffett for some unidentified millionaire with money to throw away, bid $19 million to have lunch with him. You see the immoral way that money is spent by these rich people who have it then you have poor people running around talking about the big government in Washington want to tax these rich people and the corporations. And the corporations laugh. We're, we're starving these peasants. And because they have a peasant mentality, they're speaking up for us so that our taxes won't be cut. But their taxes are raised. 
our taxes that we should pay or not pay, they go into our pockets and the pockets of our shareholders. And these poor slobs out here paying all this money for the gasoline, we're the ones driving the big cars, not them. And if we have the electric cars and they cost a lot of money and we got them, then we're not gonna pay a gasoline tax because we don't use gasoline. Well, what do they need a tax on gasoline for? To make the roads drivable so that the rich people who drive electric cars will have good roads to drive on with their electric cars, but the ones who drive gasoline powered cars are the ones whose gasoline is taxed at an exorbitant rate to keep the roads fixed so that these rich people who can buy and sell poor people by the dozens can drive their electric cars. And that's how America operates. And the poor, unenlightened, average stiff, as they're referred to, can't pay his or her rent. They have trouble buying gas. Food prices are skyrocketing. And then people's attention will be diverted to the one who happens to be in, in the office of president now, Joe Biden. Biden cannot make anything happen. But this is a good way to get him and the Democrats out of office, just like the Democrats would do if a Republican was in office and the bottom fell out of the economy. They could show that the Republicans are responsible and the poor people who don't have much in the way of education cannot look beyond their nose, cannot think beyond the length of their arm and their fingertips will accept what the politicians tell them. Your child can't go to school because this person or this party is in office. White people making up the vast majority of the population. And if you put all the other groups together, then you can say that, well, white people are still in the majority, but not as big a majority. These far right wing racist Nazi groups are saying that Jews and black people are going to replace all these white people. Now, if you just take all the Jews and the black people, they're the ones, and you're leaving out Latinos, Native Americans, and everybody who's not a brand A white person, these relatively few by comparison, black people and Jews and Jews are going to replace all of these hundreds of millions of white people. And ignorant white people accept that. That's why our job is so difficult. We don't have intelligent white people to deal with. We have those who are suckered, who are tricked, who are bamboozled, thinking that because they've got it hard, it's because some black people who can't pay rent and haven't been able to pay rent are in this country plotting to replace white people. Have you ever heard such a stupid thing in your life where you never had a group of people as stupid as the majority of white people in America apparently are? And you hear me use words like who apparently are, who seem to be. And if we go by actions, and facts, then they are the most stupid people in the world. And they call me a racist because I react by saying I'm not gonna let a white person walk on me by documenting the wrongful things that white people have done, not only just but poor white people. And I'm a racist because I won't take it smiling. I brush my teeth with Colgate, Crest, various toothpaste, not the polish of a white man's boots that get on my teeth from me licking his boots. But a funny thing happens. 
when you have the white man pull his lips up, then you see boot polish on his teeth. So these white people are boot lickers. They're the lap dogs. They're the running dog lackeys. White people. And they let a few loud mouth, gun carrying white people intimidate all of them. And the ones who carry the guns are brave when they've got guns and the others don't have them. Why don't they go attack a military base? Why don't they go attack a National Guard garrison? It's like, and why didn't those cops run into the school where they heard gunfire? Bob Hope was a comedian. He used to go and entertain the troops and make them laugh, and he didn't have to carry a gun. So one guy, he was hot about that. He said, Hope, you encourage us to go out here and go to war, and when a battle comes, we're out there and you're on the stage somewhere in America making people laugh. Why don't you carry a gun and come with us in the combat? Bob Hope let that slow smile go across his face. He said, I'll tell you why I'm not going to do it. A fella can get hurt doing that. And although it was an audience of soldiers, they uproared in laughter. Bob Hope told the truth. I'm not going to carry a rifle and go into combat. A fella can get hurt doing that. A cop who is supposed to put his life on the line for the person who needs it. That person's life is to take priority over the cop's life. And you know why the cops didn't go running in where that shooter was? A cop could get hurt doing that. There was a basketball game and it was not a professional game. And I don't know whether it was a college or high school, but the referee collapsed on the floor and he was having a heart problem. And one of the coaches ran over and he happened to have been, he was a fireman, he, he was a medic with the fire department. He immediately started uh, CPR, saved the man's life. And they were praising him. He said, well, in my training as a firefighter, I'm told don't run away from the problem. Run to the problem. Run to the danger, not away from it. That's not what the cop does when he knows there's danger. If he's dealing with somebody who is unarmed, a woman like Sandra Bland, or some of the other black women who've been shot down by cops. Then they're bold. But when there's somebody who's their even change, like skulking jackals, they do like jackals do. Yeah, well, I'm not the only one who will say, my ISIS is the police. My time is up, and as I have a way of ending it, as the canary said, when informed that the door of the cage is open, I'm out of here. Thank you for watching the Ernie Chambers Show. If you'd like to make suggestions, email us at ewcfacts at gmail.com. That's ewcfacts at gmail.com. This has been an EWC Communication Production.